Larry is one of the most knowledgeable laboratory technicians I've ever been around. And I mean that sincerely. He has an understanding of laboratory A to Z. And he has quite an understanding, better than most dentists, I think, of uh, just the dental part and the laboratory part of occlusion and, and dental anatomy and things like that. He, he really is a treasure to have here at the school. He's agreed to go through and do a scan. And we're going to film that. I'll upload it to Canvas, but you all get to kind of watch it so it's one more of what's current with the software version of the process of scanning and designing your crown. So with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Larry. Okay. Um, I'm just letting you know right now that I've used multiple different scanners, probably six or seven in my career. This is probably one that I've used the least. I've probably only used it five or six times. So most of these are intuitive and you can walk through as soon as the software is open to be able to look at pictures. They, they kind of give you a step-by-step -step understanding of it, everything that's going on through the process. Um, I'm assuming this can be seen here. So whenever you're dealing with a scanner, after you get, you're graduated from the school and you're in practice, rarely are you going to use a desktop scanner. These are going to be mostly the mobile chair side scanners you guys are going to be using. So here in the school, you use this to learn, but when you get downstairs, even into the clinic, you'll use the chair side scanners intraorally into the patient's mouth. So I'm going to take that with a grain of salt when we're dealing with this. It's more how you scan for just the sim lab and the software, when you go downstairs, the lab will be the one primarily doing all the designing of the crowns anyway. It's the scanning is completely different. But in this instance right now, what we're dealing with is we always have to open the software up. In this one, I'm opening up the three shape system. Once the software opens, it comes to a manager where you're going to actually tell the software exactly what you want to do with this. Since this is a new case, we're actually going to go into new. And we're going to click on it. And this is your command sheet where you're going to tell what you want, teeth you want, all the information that goes to the case. In this, the operator, just keep on tech one. It doesn't matter. External lab, just leave it as none. Um, when you change those sometimes, it won't allow you to actually do the scanning and actually the exporting. So leave those as is. The first thing you want to deal with is the patient information. And here I'm just going to go L's on both, first and the last name, and same thing for comments. This is for the lab information, so when you're sending something out, you always have to name the file, especially if you're downstairs using your chair side system, so that when you're choosing the lab, you'll have DSG, you'll have the different labs that you can actually send this to. Your comments are more your lab prescription. That's what you want the lab to know. Um, so you're gonna actually choose that. Up here on the top, the importance, just leave that alone. Um, in real world, if you're wanting that to be rushed or there's some sort of an instance where you need the case back quickly, you can actually put high importance and everything else. Can I ask a question there, Larry? Uh-huh. Is this the difference? Uh, the design or something 2017, that's just the new software, right? Yeah. It just says 14, and I noticed you can choose that. Yeah. 17 is the most current software version that's on this, and you want to keep it on the 17 because... There might be things that are in the 14 that will actually stop it working. So keep that on the Dental Designer 17. That's the most current version of the software that's available on this system. Then down here, you have the big screen. It shows all the different teeth. At that point in time, what you're dealing with is you want to choose the tooth that you're going, or teeth, that you want to actually um, restore or scan. In this instance, I'm using it for the first molar on the lower, so I'm going to choose the tooth that I want. Then over here, you've got different 
icons. And under anatomy, you'll see when I click on that, it has multiple different areas of concern here. You have a full contour zirconia, you've got pontix if you're dealing with a bridge. But before you can choose any of that, you have to choose the teeth you want to deal with. So you're actually choosing that. In this case scenario, you're just dealing with a zirconia crown. So I've clicked on that and now it knows what the material choice is going to be. At the top right, it's going to say scan settings. You have the model, which is the object as you're dealing with, you can actually scan an impression. You can actually um, just design from a digital impression. Say you scan something downstairs and you want to design it on a different computer, you would actually choose the digital scan. In this instance, I'm doing it straight from a model. Anytime you're dealing with this, you're going to deal with it from a model perspective. So I'm going to click on model. There is an antagonist model, which is the opposing. So you can actually use a bite. This is a lab function that we used to use a long time ago. Nowadays, you can just put models together and the models become the bite. So I'm going to actually use an antagonist model. Then you can actually scan something without having a section model. I always have it as a section model because I want to scan the individual dies so I can get the best margins I can. That's the most important thing when you're dealing with it from a lab perspective. If you do it from a solid model that's not sectioned, it could, especially if it's subgingival, cause an issue with not capturing the margin correctly. So always do the section, especially if you're dealing with your dies here. Section your dies and actually choose section. So when we go into design this real quick, you'll be able to see exactly why we do it that way. Once all those are selected, you're going to actually hit OK. Once that's done, it's actually saved it into this file, which allows you now to open it and go into the, the design software. So when you double click on that, it will actually save that information and lock it, but now it should open up for the design. There we go. So once it gets to this screen, this is a very intuitive software. A lot of them you scan and then you have to close it and reopen it into a design software. This one just goes right to the next without having to close and reopen the file somewhere else. If you look over here on the left, you'll see exactly how you're going to place the models directly into the actual scanner. So you have all these different plates that go directly into the, the system. And if you look on, you won't be able to see it here, but on this plate, there's two dots. If you look on the screen, if you can actually see a screen there, there's two dots directly on the plate, especially like on this this model, the section model that's a quadrant, that tells you where to place it. So in this instance, it's going to tell you everything you want to know. It's telling you to scan the lower jaw first. So at that point, you're just physically taking off the lower model, placing it exactly how it shows on the computer, which in this scenario, you want the buckle surface of that model, if it's a quadrant model like I'm using, to face the back of the machine and place it directly in to that holder exactly how the picture shows. It's fairly simple just like that. And what you're going to do now is you're going to actually place that into the scanner exactly how it shows on the computer. Once you open and close the drawer, It's saying the axis is not correct on this, so bear with me a second. By the way, when it wasn't working last week, the reason was we had to calibrate it down now. Um, yeah, that, that would have been a weird one because of I had already calibrated a little while ago, so it wasn't allowing it to go because of the calibration. Okay. Yeah, I mean, these will, when I calibrated these a while ago, that 40-day 
ago was me calibrating it when you guys were on your break. Um, the calibrations don't really stop it. The axis inside the, the actual scanner, it's on a swing arm. So it's actually swinging around under the camera systems. So if you play something in and move that arm around, usually you get that error message because it's not on zero. If you reopen it and close it down again, it should recenter. And that's what I just did. I didn't do anything with it. But the calibration's there when you're in a lab and you're using this thing eight hours a day, five days a week, constant one after another, they want you to calibrate it about weekly. When you're only using it once every month in a handful, it can be actually be calibrated once every month or once every two months or even six months. I think the left computer, the last calibration was, I think I told you, it was like a thousand days ago. <laughs> so the calibration is one that if you're doing restorative work on it, you want to make certain it's calibrated because if the calibration's off, it could actually throw your settings off when you get your crowns back. So this first screen here is all you're doing is you're actually centering the point directly on the res restoration you want to actually be fabricated or that prep. So I just clicked on the buckle margin there and told it that's the area. I like to actually make certain I capture a lot of detail with all the teeth. So I highlight everything that I can see close by it and that was just left clicking and then right clicking to actually highlight. So I highlight all the teeth. Once that's done, then you just go into the next button. Hit next. Now it's gonna go into finer detail and it's actually going to take maybe an extra 10, 15 seconds by scanning all of that. But usually takes less than 30 seconds in total to get that lower model completely scanned. So now, right now, that's all we're waiting on is the scanning of that. And if you ever get lost, look, at, just go to your, that left screen and it tells you, kind of tells you exactly what to do, what to scan, when to scan it, how to scan it. As long as you're following those pictures and those diagrams, it's very intuitive all the way through the process. And there's the final scan. All I do now is I like to actually take a look at it. When you see the colors of red and all these different colors, that's usually just indicative of areas that may not have scanned properly. In this instance, it's not that big of a deal because later on we're actually going to um, scan that die completely, take it out of the holder, put that die directly into another holder and scan it. So those little red areas will disappear in a couple screens later. Once that's done, you kind of reviewed it. Now you can hit next. Now it's telling you to place the upper jaw in or the opposing model. And again, if you're following this diagram right here, it will tell you exactly how to place this model directly into the um, scanner. Once you do that and you, you have it, if you close the lid, this scanner should automatically start to scan. Just bear with this for about 30 seconds, it should be done. And there's that model right there. So that's just the opposing. It's not all that critical when you're dealing with um, the opposing too much because of the fact you're just dealing with the occlusal surfaces more than anything. And I'm just making certain there's no voids, nothing in there that's going to interfere with the actual design of the crown. Right now, everything looks good on it. So again, just hit next. I haven't opened anything. I haven't opened the doors, nothing like that. So all I'm doing now is I'm going to lift the door open 
and physically put my models back together. What this is doing right now is it's um, wanting to now scan the entire model. And if you look on it, the model's held together with this upper and lower plating system. Here we don't have that, hence why I have rubber bands on my wrist. Um, what you need to do is you need to keep the models together. So what I wind up doing is I just use a rubber band and I wrap it so it does not interfere with the scan. So I'm placing the rubber band around the very heel areas of my model. And I don't know, you guys can't see it, but if I hold it such, it's not opening and closing. The other thing I wanna do is make certain my die, that little die that's there, because it's quite loose in there, it will flop around. So if you have to use a little bit of this tacky stuff, just to place it directly onto the base of that die, just to hold it in place so when it's scanning, it's not going to move at all. And I don't know if you guys won't be able to see it, but I just used some of that tack just to place right down against the frame so that when I place it in, that die is not going to move. If it jettisons out of the holder, of course it might be high when it comes back for the crown or low, depending on which way it goes. All I'm doing now is I'm placing exactly how the screen shows right now. I'm placing that directly back into the holder exactly how the picture shows it. And then I wind up placing that directly back into the scanner. Once I close the door, it should automatically start to scan now. And if this is all correct, the scanner will put these models together. If it's not correct, it has an area that you can align the models by pinpointing three contact areas. Um, in this case scenario, it's put the occlusion correct on the model. So at this point in time right now, it's just processing and it's going to allow me to go to the next step. So in here, I'm just going into next. At this point in time, if you can see down here, over to the left, it allows me to scan individual dies. So if this is say three crowns, it will tell you exactly what tooth to do first, second, third. So in this, because it's only an individual crown, I'm going to actually take this back out and actually pull my die out. And in this, it really doesn't matter how you place the die. It could be front, back, doesn't matter because it's going to actually take the triangulation points within the die or on the stone model to actually put it together directly over that individual die that's actually in the full arch scan. So once I have that done, I close the model or the door, it should automatically scan that individual die now. And those red areas that you've seen on the die or on the model before should now be eliminated because of the fact that there is no um, um, adjacent teeth. So it's only allowing for the die to be scanned and it's going to actually incorporate it directly into that full scan that was there before. It is because of the fact you're not dealing with saliva, you're not dealing with tissue, you're not dealing with adjacent teeth. It allows me to put the dyes exactly where I need them. I can pull them out of the model. You can't do that in the mouth. You can't pull the tooth out, scan the tooth by itself, and then put it back in. So these are more accurate. Um, 
the chair side versions have gotten a lot more accurate. About 20, 30 years ago when Serona started coming out with their brand new Serona scanners, they were two dimensional. And these things could barely scan an inlay. They were awful. So the chair side scanners have gotten a lot better, but the, the lab scanners are are a better image because of the fact we can actually die trim. We can do things off of the model where you guys just can't do it in the mouth. So once that's done and we have a good image of the die, at this point in time, we're gonna go next. And I can take my die back out. So the second phase of this was just the scanning phase. So the first phase was the actual process of putting the information into the system. This phase was the scan part of the image. Now we're actually going into the design. And again, it's very intuitive. You just click on design and it's saving your scan. Say you, you can't do your designing right that second. As soon as you go into the next phase, you can actually save it down and the scan's already done. You can just come back in your file two or three hours later when you have time to do the design and go directly into this phase here. So since I'm demonstrating, I'm gonna just demonstrate the quick how to design the crown. In this scenario, you see all the green dots around the margins. What you're doing is you're verifying that is the correct margin. See all the red that's coming up on this die? The red means those are undercut areas. The softwares on almost every single system I've ever used has an automatic undercut blockout system. So even if there's undercuts on the die, and this is actually a real patient's model, you can see how there's some undercuts directly onto the prep. Right there, right there, on this side. This little, this little arrow that's right in here, it's allowing you to change the path of insertion. Say you want, this is a nice prep. Sometimes they're knife edge and you're really having to gauge where you want your undercuts to be blocked out at. If you want these blocked out at a different angle, you reset this so that the angle that you're seeing on the screen is going to be indicative of what you want the crown to be. If you don't get your path of insertion right, when it goes to be inserted into the mouth, all those undercuts that were blocked out that you needed, needed um, might not be there if you don't change the path of insertion. It's as simple as rotating this around and getting the path of insertion so you can see the entire margin surface of this restoration. So right there is the best path of insertion. I can see all the green dots. I can see all the margins. And all you're gonna do at this point in time is go into next. Now it's actually checking for the margin direction, which is exactly how I want that. So what I wanna do is get those two arrows lined so the margin's coming straight vertical. And that's what I'm dealing with right there. So once that's done, you see all these settings on the bottom left? I'm a, are you seeing them down here on the cursor? I can't see it, the arm's in the way. These are all your internal settings of the crown. These you don't want to mess with on the, these computers um, because you can change your die spacer settings, you can change your mesial distal contacts, you can change your occlusal contacts. If you put too much of material in certain areas, either you're going to have a problem seating the crown, you're either going to have problems with contacts being too tight or too loose. So these settings here, unless you're designing and milling out the crown yourself, usually you want to leave these settings alone and let the lab, based on the information they have on the best settings, to use that. If you're designing it intraorally based on the intraoral scanner and you're gonna mill it yourself, say later on, if we have a milling unit or, or you get down to your practice later on in life, you might have to change these based on your own personal preferences. But that's what all these settings are. You don't really want to change them. They're usually standard setting, but I can change them based on preference. So in this scenario, I'm just going to go into next again. Every time I do this and I go into the next, if I ever close this out, it will save directly to the final stage you were already at. So based on what your preferences were, 
this is what's actually come up and you can actually now change different settings. You can see how, I'll place this, you can see how this contact right here is open. If you flip this all the way around, you can physically see where this tooth doesn't have any contact area there and some there. But all these tools that are right in here, this bottom left, it says sculpt. You can actually go in here and now change this crown any way you want. Um, you can change it by direction. Um, so if I want to rotate it or move it, I can come in here and I want to do a, make it a little bit more buckle. Just like that, I can move it mesial and distally. I normally get this aligned the way I want before I start changing the form. So I'm, I'm looking down my buckle corridor here at cusps and making certain my cusps are angled right. Same thing over here. I can make certain all my cusps are angled here. I'm not too worried about anything else at the moment. Up here in the top right, you have more tools. One of these tools is you can actually put the opposing, see how it disappears? You can actually put the opposing model in there. You can see the lingual cusps on that lower um, are way too um, into the center of that fossa and too high. So I want to be able to change that and I can actually rotate this and bring it, or not rotate, but re-manipulate and bring that back a little bit because the rest of these teeth are edge to edge pretty much. So I want that to be edge to edge and make those lingual cusps a little bit more into that fossa of the opposing. But you're like, eh, too high. Once I have that done, I can actually remove that for right now because now I just want to deal with shape. Then you can come up in here into single um, tools and I actually can swing this around. See how I can move it circular? So I can actually change it circular the way I want. I can actually change the angle. I'm not moving the whole crown now, I'm just moving the angle of the crown. I can make it a little bit more buckle or lingual if I need to actually create the different kind of crown, the size of it. I can come over here and add some to that distal contact. And a lot of times I will look underneath as I do that to verify my contacts. And this is just now personal preference. When you go to do this, you might sit there and say, oh, I like a certain type of contact in there. And you can actually make it as strong or as light as you physically want to make it just by changing some of those diagrams. Now, some of these other areas, like some of these tools, these are, you can manipulate points. So I can come in here and I can actually stretch things out. I can actually create a different size. If you look down on the bottom left, I can actually make the whole thing come out. So how strong and light you actually make these points is all based on this individual morphing tool that's down on the bottom left. So if you want something that's very small, this is only 0.7 of a millimeter. So if I make a change on it, it's only going to be a pinpoint. But if I want to make a large area of change, now I can actually change a large area. Remember how I said that these lingual cusps were very high? Now I can actually morph it in oops, by placing it through the model and sitting there saying, oh, we've got a problem in certain areas. And that is these areas right in here need to come down and out so we can get rid of all those interferences. And there's a couple different ways of doing it. I like doing it through the, the opposing because that allows me to change this without having to bring up a whole bunch of different images. So once you figure out what your occlusion is, you've got the occlusion um, corrected. Now you're like, man, the occlusion's all flat. Well, the flatness of this is based on the opposing. They have a lot of wear. You can see right in here on that second bicuspid how they have the wear right in here. 
Well, you've got the same kind of facets right into that lingual, those lingual cusps, but that's how the occlusion's making it happen. So right now you can be rest assured when you get these completed that the occlusion is going to be correct just by manipulating it through that model. Make certain you, you highlight it. You can see now that there's nothing going through that model which will interfere with the occlusion when you go to seat the crown. Um, there are certain other areas like this little spray gun. You can actually add and subtract the material. Down here you see where it says wax knife. It has a plus, a minus, and a teardrop. The plus is always used for adding material. So if you want to add material, I can turn around and add whatever I want in whatever thicknesses I want. So if you want to put your initial on this thing, you can actually initial it. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, if you want to take it away, just do the opposite. You're just taking the information away that you just added, or you can turn around and smooth it completely. And that's what that teardrop is. It allows you to smooth the restoration. Say after you get done doing it, doing all your work on the crown and everything else, you might sit there and say, I don't like how rough it is. So you want to just click over it and you smooth the details down. Say you want to add a lot of contour to the anatomy. You can actually go in here. You can actually change a lot of the the micron settings and you can actually come in here and create more of your your fossas if you really have a young patient I don't normally do it when it's an older patient but if you want to create a little bit more anatomy separation you can go in there and just add some by taking away some of the material once you do that, if your contacts are nice, I can see them right in here. You can see where the tissue area right in here is dealing with it. But you can see the crown is actually lower than the margin. That will fix itself when you go into the next phase. So when you go into next, it's going to actually seat this directly to. Oh, good. See what it says right in here? It says it violates standards. It means it's too thin in certain areas. Um, you can sit there and say, would you like to enforce minimum thickness standards? Yes to all. Now it turns around and it's going to, should add this, if this is like any other system, it adds the material automatically to enforce the minimum thickness of that particular material you chose. So if you chose Emacs and it requires 1.5 millimeters, it's going to make certain it stays at 1.5 and it would automatically put it in there. If it's zirconia, it's set at 0.7 of a millimeter thickness, it will actually do that for you and correct it before you can actually go into the final stage. So in that, now I've got all my, my crown completed the way I want it done. Yep. Um, that's a good point. Um, and normally in these systems in here, you actually have a color coding system that allows for it. So if I go back. I know one of the settings on the upper right allowed that, and then it got weird because I think you can set your distance between. E exactly. I don't know what to set that at. Um, normally the settings themselves are set by the computer. So in here, on this part right in here, you can actually change the coloring systems to see how when I click on this right here, it tells you 0.49 microns. Um, it only does it when I'm changing it. See how it does that? You can actually change the coloring system to it. And if you wanted it higher or lower, you can actually change that. And that's what the coloring system does. So you, if you want it at a negative, um, you go right to zero. That gives it the perfect occlusion based on the parameters, but say you like to grind your crowns in. Not saying you do, I don't think anybody does, but if you do, you can make this high, and then once you get done doing it and you go to put it onto the models, then you can actually tap and touch and everything else. Um, so it depends on what you want, but that's what this setting is, this color coding. So right now, when I lowered it, and I kept lowering it, right now it's set at I'm getting it right around 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.10 of a micron. 
um, or a, a millimeter. And no, no, you're, what it is, is it's already there. The color coding is there when the crown is showing up through the antagonist. So, Exactly. What it is, is based on lowering this is what it's going to be. Right now I can't really see it without, let me remove this, but you can see right now, can you see the points of contact, the yellow there, the yellow with that red triangle, even on your mesial and distal contacts, it's in red. So if I change this right in here, well, that's only dealing with the occlusion. You might have to forgive me on, um, that's margin thickness there. I'm not certain where the mesial and distal occlusion is on these, um, as far as the, the thicknesses, but you can see right in here, it's minimum thickness right in here, right there. And that, these are all cross sections. There is usually a tool, and you'll have to forgive me here, because every so software I've ever used in different scanners allows for a cutting tool, where when it's going up high through your antagonist, you can just click on it, it cuts it. It literally cuts it out. Some people don't like it, because if it cuts it out, then all of a sudden you got flat cuss tips when you want young anatomy. So I've always gotten in the habit of not doing that, and just literally shaping the crown the way I want it. But I'd have to play with this a little bit more and then I'd have to get back with you on, on some of those tools because right now I'm not 100% certain. But ultimately you just take it down below and it will have an ideal. Exactly, yes. I mean, you could do it by, by hand or from the computer. I just don't know the, the app to it. And it's real easy with the wax knife to add, you know, take a little off or add a little. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. And by, by removing it, it's not like when I was removing that down, I was removing a like two millimeters. I was just removing it slightly down just to where I knew it was outside of that occlusion parameter. Okay, thank you. There's so one more question. Where you lower the cusp, but then you get an error code saying you're not thick enough. Yeah, that's usually when you're getting in the error codes, a lot of times the thickness material is down near the central fossa of the triangular ridges and the supplemental anatomy. It's very rare on the occlusion of the cusps. So when it was coming out it was too thin, it was coming out too thin into those fossa areas. But most softwares allow for that, that air note to come through and say, hey, you're below the minimum thickness. It won't tell you we're gonna change it automatically. It makes you choose it. You might suddenly say, no, I'll leave it as is, and it will still allow you to mill it, but in those areas, it's gonna be too thin. Um, and that's what that did. It wasn't telling me it was too thin in the cusp areas. It was telling me that there's some areas within the crown that was too thin. And I knew it was in the fossa areas where you're trying to create nice anatomy and everything else. But, it, but yes, that, that's how you fix that. One more question. The question is, do you want us to stay within that ideal range? And the answer is no. As long as you are able to design a crown that works, that doesn't get so thin that it would, it would break, and monolithic zirconium, which is what this would be, as long as you're at about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 millimeters minimum, you're going to be strong enough. Uh, and the, the machine won't let you, unless you override it, do that. So you'll see maybe in the in the deepest area of the fossa, central groove, you might approach that or be close to it, but you can still design it and mill it and it'll work just fine. So in the event that we make the crown too high, so we get our milk crown back, we remove the distance for size. Right. Exactly. So you treat it just like you would a patient, you get it back and if the contacts are too tight, you have to adjust them to the point where it it fits into place, and there's a lecture on delivering the crown. Uh, same with the occlusion. So you want to be really close. Uh, if you're going to err, though, um, we're not going to be sending these back to the lab to add porcelain.
to them, which can be done clinically. Uh, so if you're gonna err, give yourself a little extra material on proximal contacts. You need at least one good sensory type occlusal contact, and that's it. Yeah, that, and that's why I was going to suggest, I didn't know if you guys were going to be designing something, having something milled, but if you're going to, and especially going to be graded, definitely give yourself more occlusion, mesial, distal, and, occlu and the occlusal surface to where some of that material is coming through the antagonist and the opposings, because it's a lot easier to use a diamond, get some articulating paper, the thin articulating paper, and take your sections out. Go mesial, get your contact perfect. Take your distal out, get your mesial perfect, and then put your all of it together and then get your occlusion perfect and use your shim stock. I'm assuming, are they using the shim stock? Use shim stock to get a light to medium drag on, when I'm talking to the labs, the way they should be doing this is you have your working model. Then they have a solid model that comes along with this. The solid means nothing is separated. So when it, the crown is fabricated, it comes back to you guys on a solid. I don't care about the working model because the working models, the dies move, they flex. Everything flexes on this. So I'm getting my solid model so I get my mesial distal contacts perfect and I want that with, with light to medium drag where I put my shim stock through it and I hold that crown down, I can feel that shim stock coming through, both mesially and distally. If I get that, then I've got my mesial and distal contacts correct, then my occlusion comes from this. So that's the reason for the, the solid model. But if you're doing it for a grade, go a little bit heavier. I'm not talking at to where you're looking at the mesial and distal contacts in here and you're getting this massive amount of material where you're going to be spending an hour getting your mesial and distal contacts right. But if you're seeing the material come through like this, I can guarantee you're going to have to adjust it slightly to get the, the good contacts. So if you're looking at what I've done here and you can see these contacts coming through, that's kind of what you want. And if you're really worried about the occlusion contacts, just go back into those tools down here and raise them. If you can get them up through the actual opposing model that's up here and you want a couple cusps to come through, you can do that. As soon as you start closing in your models, you'll, you'll get your um, the articulating markers and you'll just diamond, just kind of just gently grind those down until you get nice shim stock drag through this. So you can make them light or you can make them heavy. But in this instance, I'm right with Dr. Taylor. Make them a little heavy. It only takes maybe five minutes, 10 minutes to get those contacts exactly right onto the model, and then you're ready to go. But make error on the, the heavy side of it instead of the light. Uh, and I don't know if they're grading for it, but, but that's what that is. This allows you to, this model here, I keep clicking on it. This one just removes the actual crown, but I'm just getting rid of that. Once this is done, again, this is talking about minimum thicknesses and everything. And this is allowing you to dictate where it's at. And that one little contact right in here, if I raise this, it'll probably make it, I'm going to add a little bit on this. Let me... I'm gonna raise the occlusion a little bit again. And that's raising the entire crown. See how everything's red? The red means it's going to go through the antagonist at those points. So you can actually go with the red and now go into your little tools as far as this removable tool. Click on the negative and you can actually come in here and negative it down until it gets out of occlusion. Whichever way you want to do it. I like doing it through the antagonist because I can see exactly where I'm high at within my opposing occlusion. Either way you do it, it's fine. But, but the red is telling you where you're high. Um, so, so those are all tools that you can utilize to actually get to the end result of the crown. So last thing I do is just check my mesial and distal contacts. If I want a little bit more contact here 
I can actually come in here and I say I want a nice broad contact. I can actually add this material just by doing that and I'm creating a lot, a little bit broader contact. If it's too slow, you can actually come back in and go to that drag tool and add a little bit more if you want. So you can play with the way the contacts are by either painting more material, taking it off, smoothing it. You can add and subtract however quick you want to do it. These tools here allow you to do that. Once you feel like, yep, that's what I want, you're just going next and you can go back. And here's that message again. Minimum thickness is uh, 4.3 is reduced by um, 0.21. I want to say yes to all, so it's going to actually fix that occlusion for me. And once that's done, it goes in here and I can actually go into close. How are they, um, Dr. Taylor? So they're going to be designing crown, having it milled. Are they sent, they're not sending it from here. They're just downloading onto a, a memory stick and we're sending them into batches to DSG and they'll, exactly. they'll mill everything. Yeah. So. So once you have this done, name this something where you know what it belongs to. I would say your name um, and whatever crown you're designing. So when you actually go in here to bulk batch this, that it's gonna be saved down onto a memory stick because all these files will be sent to one of our labs. They'll mill all of these crowns and they'll return them to that, that name. So we'll get 50, crowns back with your individual names on that particular crown. So I don't know if you're all using the same model. So, no. So they're, okay. they're, they're everyone's unique and there is a file on the desktop for your class. So when you're all done, save it to the file on the desktop. I'm going to copy that to a USB drive and that's what goes to the lab. And that's been created, hasn't it? Did you, you did that yet or not yet? I, well, well, we'll do that. So there'll be a file on the desktop for this class. Just save it to that file. And all I, all I did, once that's saved down, there's the file. You just right or left click on it, drag it wherever that file's at. You just click, drag, and drop right into that file. This is the file right here that they will now use to fabricate that crown. So basically, they're, they're just gonna take it, open it, they're not gonna adjust anything, and they're just gonna say mill, and they'll mill it out, center it, and then return all the crowns back. But it's fair, just like that, fairly easy to, um, it's just drag and drop. But once you're done with it, just go into that file, drop it in, and you're finished. Very good, um, Oh, go ahead, I oh, didn't want to interrupt um, you. Are there any questions? Concerns. And it can it can be doing with this or it can be talking about finishing the crown. And we'll go into that in more detail in a, in a couple of weeks. The, the finished delivery part. But that that's great. I think that's uh, Larry, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Over, Larry.